Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Paul said, it's kind of interesting really the things that Paul prayed for the Christians. And uh, you know, he never you, you can't find a place where Paul prayed for their problems to go away. Now tonight we're going to talk about three that are very, very important, and they're especially important to me. These are three things that have really had an impact in my life. The habit of excellence, the habit of being an excellent person, not a mediocre person, but an excellent person. The habit of being responsible, the habit of taking responsibility and no longer blaming everything that goes wrong on somebody else, and the habit of generosity. So, excellence, Philippians 1 and verse 10. The Apostle Paul, thank God I can see you tonight. I was thinking this morning, what in the world is wrong? So that you may surely learn to sense and prize what is vital, that means what's really important, and approve and prize what is excellent and of real value, recognizing the highest and the best and distinguishing the moral difference, so that you may be untainted and pure and unerring and blameless, so that with sincere hearts and certain and unsullied you may approach the day of Christ, not stumbling nor causing others to stumble. Paul said, it's kind of interesting really the things that Paul prayed for the Christians. And, uh, You know, he never, you, you can't find a place where Paul prayed for their problems to go away. You know that? Can't find one place where Paul prayed for their problems to go away. He prayed that they would learn how to endure with a good attitude, that they would learn to know and understand the love of God and be rooted deep in that love. And he prayed things like this. He prayed character things, that they would know what excellence was and that they would always choose the better thing, always choose the more excellent thing. And you know, in, in almost everything in life, you have two ways that you can go. You can do the right thing or you can do the wrong thing, but even then, when you decide to do the right thing, there's a better do way to do the right thing, and then there's a way to do the right thing where you just do what you barely have to do to barely get by. And I believe that God wants us to move on now to excellence. Maybe you've come out of doing the wrong thing and you're starting to make some good choices, and some right choices, but When Dave and I started the ministry the way it is now, which I say the way it is now because I was taught home Bible studies five years and then I worked for somebody else five years and so now we've had this ministry for 25 years that we started. And um, God put some things on my heart. He said, if you do these things, I'll be able to bless you. And we know that everything that comes to us comes by God's undeserved favor, but still when God tells us to do something, we need to obey him to release that fullness of that favor in our lives. And so he said, do everything you do with excellence. So from the very beginning of this ministry, we felt like that we had a mandate from God to do everything that we did with excellence and to the best of our ability to be excellent people. Now that does not mean perfect people. That does not mean perfection, it just simply means to take what you have and do the very best that you can. Every single one of you can be excellent, no matter where you're at in your spiritual maturity. If you were born again a year ago, or if you've been born again for 30 years, the person who's been born again a year can still be seen by God to be just as excellent as the one who's got 30 years of experience with God. Because if you take the one year's knowledge that you have and you do the very best that you can with it and to the best of your ability for where you're at right now, you serve God with your whole heart, God will count you as just as excellent as the person who's had more time to change a lot more. And it's just so important that we have that good conscience that we're doing the best that we can. Not, we're not perfect, we make mistakes, but to give God your best. How many of you know that God gave us his best? We serve an excellent God. 
a wonderful God who does exceedingly abundantly above and beyond. So Paul prayed that people would learn to choose and prize what was excellent. And that's my prayer for you tonight, that as you hear this, you will be convicted and convinced, not condemned, but convicted that there's some areas in your life where you can come up higher and just represent God in a better way. We can be mediocre without any effort at all. We can drift through life making no real difference nor leaving behind any legacy. You know, I want to know when God brings me out of here and into his presence that I'm leaving something. I don't want to just pass through and be a taker. I don't want to just take up space for 70 or 80 years and then disappear. I want to leave a legacy. We can form the habit of being excellent and inexcellent in everything that we think, everything that we say, and everything that we do. Excellence is going the extra mile. Excellence is doing a little bit more than we would actually have to do. It's not perfection. Edward Bliss said, the pursuit of excellence is gratifying and healthy. The pursuit of perfection is frustrating, neurotic, and a terrible waste of time. <laughs> I love that. You see, when you try to be perfect, you're just going to be frustrated all the time because Jesus died for imperfect people. And the truth is, he's probably going to always leave a little imperfection in all of us because if we didn't have any, we would think we didn't need him. And he's always going to keep us to where we need him. Thank God we're always going to need him. So, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. The Bible actually teaches us that we are called to be excellent. It's the call on our life. For his divine power has bestowed upon us all things that are re requisite and suited to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of him who called us by and to his own glory and excellence and virtue. So say with me, I am called to be excellent. I am called to be excellent. Say it again, I am called to be excellent. I am called to be excellent. Not, mediocre, not mediocre. Not lukewarm. Not, lukewarm. not, sloppy, not sloppy. Not lazy. Not lazy. Excellent. excellent. Now one more time, I am called to be excellent. I am called to be excellent. All right, you know why it's so important? We are God's representatives. We're Christ's representatives in the earth. When Jesus came, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Wow. I've revealed his character to you, Jesus said. I have manifested his character to you. People needed to see God. So Jesus came, took on a fleshly body, and revealed the character of God. Well, you know what? Jesus is gone now. <laughs> yeah, and here we are. And he sent the Holy Spirit, and he said, you're going to be better off when I leave. And people couldn't understand that. But he said, you're going to be better off. And you know why people were better off? Because Jesus could only be one place at one time. But the Holy Spirit is in all of us all the time. And you know, maybe you would have to travel like I do to get the full impact of what God is doing around the world. But now here we are in Tampa, one, one city in one state in the whole world. And here we have an arena full of people tonight who love God and are hungry for his word. And You know, to watch people worship, to me, watching people worship God is just the most beautiful thing. And also, I think it's beautiful to watch people give. I love to watch people give because I think that's an amazing thing when God can change your heart to such a degree that you actually can say you enjoy giving your money away. You actually get excited about it. I mean, what kind of nut would cheer when somebody says, I'm going to take your money? <laughs> but this is going on all over the world. When I go to Indonesia in January, this will be going on in the stadium that will be in there. When I go to India, field full of people. There are people in prisons who love Jesus. There are people all over the place. There are people in Africa. There are people in India, people in Asia, people in every city, people in every state, 
all over the world there are people but you know what our problem is we haven't turned the lights on now some have obviously some have but we have to keep urging more and more people to understand that now people need to see Jesus through you they're not going to see him if they don't see him through you. And everybody says that they want a ministry. Wait, you, you have a ministry. All you need to do is get out and live the way that you're supposed to live. And that every one of you can be in full-time ministry. God doesn't want everybody to, have a, to be on a pulpit. God doesn't want everybody to be a TV preacher. God doesn't want everybody to be in front of a crowd like I am. By and large, the most people are led to Christ one-on-one -on -one by people in their everyday life living out the Christian life and having an impact on people by just being what God wants them to be. And if we don't teach you to do that, then we failed in our mission. So I have to keep trying to get across to you how important it is that you not just go to church and go home and nothing's different and go back to church and go home and nothing's different. It, what, what good is it if you flip my TV program on every day and you say, I've got all your books and all your tapes? The thing that makes a difference is if you get out in the world and let your light shine. If you're good to people, if you love people, if you don't act like everybody else. And so God is calling us to develop a habit, yes, a habit of always doing everything the best way that it can be done. I'm preaching better than you're acting, but that's all right. Let me give you a little example of what I'm talking about. I just, I just came across this scripture. I was just reading the Bible before I came over here tonight. and I was all studied up, and I just started reading. And I was in Timothy. And, uh, so 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1, if the guys in the back can find it real quick, put it up. I'd actually like you to see this. Let all who under the yoke as bondservants... And that just means if you're an employee. How many of you are employees? You work for somebody. All right. Let all of you that are employees esteem their own personal masters or their bosses worthy of honor and the fullest respect. So that the name of God, now here's why. So that the name of God and the teaching about him may not be brought into disrepute and blasphemed. So here's one way that you can be excellent. You can go to work, and even if you don't like your boss, you have to love him even if you don't like him. You know that? Did you hear me? And you need to pray for him. And this scripture is saying, in order for you to let your light shine, don't you gossip about him, and don't you criticize him, and don't you get with all the other employees and say bad things about him. Now, what do you think of that? Oh, I see you guys looking at each other. <laughs> when I saw that scripture tonight, I thought, bingo, got them. Because <laughs> there's no telling how many people do that. I worked for somebody one time, and I didn't think they treated me right. And I would get, 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 you know, to all the other employees at the place. A lot of us felt that way. And then God finally dealt with me enough that I knew I needed to stop gossiping to other employees, so I'd go home and talk to Dave. <laughs> and then the Lord finally got me to the point where he said, you know, it doesn't really matter who you're talking to. Listen to what he said. It's the words that do the damage. So you need to pray for the person, and while you're at it, thank God you have a job at all. May not be the perfect place. And you know, you don't, you don't talk about them. You don't stop talking about them in a bad way. They may even deserve it. <laughs> it might even be justified. But God is saying, in order for you to represent me properly out in the world, you don't do it. Now, I'm asking if I've got any people here tonight that are willing to come up higher and you're willing to start doing what God asks you to do, not because you feel like it or you don't feel like it, but just because you want to represent Him right out in the world. We're not representing God if we're acting like everybody else. 
What does the Bible say? Come ye out from among them and be separate. That doesn't mean act like you're better than everybody else and, you know, don't have anything to do with anybody that's not, believe, not, that's not a believer. It means to get out there with them, but don't act like them and let them see an example of the life that they can have in Christ shining through you. This is very, very, very important to all of us. 2 Corinthians 5.20 So we are Christ's ambassadors. I love this. God is making his appeal, as it were, through us. We as Christ's representatives beg you for the sake, for his sake, to lay hold of the divine favor now offered to you and be reconciled to God. You're Christ's ambassadors. Think about this. God is trying to speak to people through you. He is trying, every day when you got to your house, he's trying to draw somebody to him through you. Amen. And those of you watching by TV, you know, we're doing this really for you. For all the millions of people that watch by TV. You, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are his personal representative. And everything that you do either honors and glorifies him or it dishonors him and doesn't glorify him. I'm going to tell you when a lot of things changed in my life. When I got a revelation that I'm about to share with you and I hope that you can grab this tonight. We have to stop living for people. And we have to stop thinking that if nobody's watching, then what we do doesn't matter. Why? Because God is always watching. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He has one eye on us all the time. And we need to learn to live before God. Before, before what I like to call the all-seeing eye. And when we really begin to get up every day, not just go to church on Sunday. And I'm not just trying to pick on that. I want you to go to church on Sunday. But I'll tell you what, it, 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 it's not enough to just go to church on Sunday and then get out in the world and not act any different than anybody else and then go to church on Sunday and then go in and go to church on Sunday. Jesus didn't die so we could all just go to church. He died so we could have an intimate relationship with God through him and get out in the world and represent him. Now, we need, to, we need to fellowship with one another, and we need to go to church to be taught, and you need to be being taught how to live. And I'll just take another step. If I'm going to be in trouble, I might as well be in big trouble. <laughs> if you're going to a church where you're not learning anything, then you need to just get somewhere where you can learn and grow. And if grandma gets mad and mama gets mad and Aunt Susie gets mad, you know, they're not going to stand before God for you. You cannot live on snacks, little, little, I mean, you got to have the word and somebody's got to get down with you and say, look, we got to learn how to live. We got to get out there and get the junk out of our life and let God help us and grow up and be what God wants us to be. Amen. Amen. You know, Henry Kissinger, in his book that he wrote about the White House years, tells a story about a Harvard professor who had given an assignment and was now collecting the papers, and he handed them back to the next day to the students, and at the bottom of one of them, he wrote, is this the best you can do? And the student thought it over and thought, well, no. Probably not. And so the professor said, well, go do it again, then hand it back in. He turned it in again, and the guy gave it back to him. Same message. Is this the best you can do? <laughs> well, this went back and forth for like, I don't know, it says 10 times in the story. Till finally the student said, yes, this is the best I can do. And the professor replied, okay, now I'll read it. <laughs> he didn't even read it before that. 
because he wanted to know if the guy really believed it was the best that he could do or did he just turn in something to get a grade and get over that and go on to the next thing. I do not even know how to tell you how it will change your heart and change your life. And maybe, many of you probably have already made this decision, but if you have not, if you make the decision, I really want to be an excellent person because I, you know what? I want God to be proud of me. Don't you? I want some people in the earth that can really make him proud. And I, you know, I mean that in the right way. We just need to do our best for God. And every day we're going to have to repent for something. I'm not, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm just talking about if you do the best that you can, then God, of course, I mean, he accepts us anyway. But he, 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 I think that that says a lot about our character and our relationship with God. How many of you agree with that? So I want you just to make a decision that you're going to be excellent. Now, live for the Lord. Colossians 3, 23, and 24. Whatever might be your task, work at it heartily, not hardly. <laughs> Sometimes we get a little mixed up. Maybe you don't have your contact in like I did this morning. <laughs> it's amazing how much better I can see tonight. Whatever might be your task, work at it heartily from the soul as something done for the Lord and not for men. You know what, let me, let me just be plain. If you sit in your office and you do personal stuff on the internet, and then when your boss walks in, you pretend like you're working. <laughs> do I dare say what I really wanna say? <laughs> then isn't that kinda like stealing and lying? Wow. Well, everybody does it. You ain't everybody. You are not everybody. You are a child of God. Do you want what everybody else has? Look around and ask yourself if you want what everybody else has. Well, if you don't, then you got to learn to live like Jesus, not like everybody else. Yeah, it's going to get quieter in here tonight before it's over. You better be glad I got three habits or because I can't stay on this one all night. You know, God started teaching me like in 1976, back when I was touched by God and filled with the Spirit. I'd been a Christian for a long time, but I was a mediocre, compromising. I mean, I did love the Lord, and honestly, I can tell you, I think I would have gone to heaven if I would have died, I started to say I would have died if I would have went to heaven. I was about to have my words mixed up. <laughs> I would have gone to heaven if I would have died. I really did believe in Jesus. And I don't believe that you, I don't believe you have to do this stuff that I'm talking about tonight to go to heaven. I'll tell you that. Because you're not saved by your excellence. You're saved by His excellence. So, let's, I, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not talking about you trying to do better because you've got to earn something from God or because He's going to give you more if you do. I'm talking about trying to do better for one reason and one reason only, because you love God and you want to glorify Him. This is not about you getting something from God. This is about you just learning to live for God and for His glory and to be a representative for Him. And you know, when you, when you really get that sensing every day that God is with you all the time, and that He's involved in everything you do, and you have that intimacy with God, it changes this whole Christian walk. It can't possibly be boring when that's the case. There is no way that you can be bored as a Christian when you learn to really just live with Him and for Him and let Him be involved in every area of your life. Come on, let Him out of the Sunday morning compartment. He wants to invade your whole life. He wants to be involved in every single thing that you do. I'm encouraging you to focus on the good thing that you want to do and stop big S-T-O-P focusing on the bad thing you don't want to do. 
Bible says in Romans 12, 21, don't let yourself be overcome by evil, but overcome and master evil with good. So that means that we can overcome bad habits by focusing on making good habits. This community likes boys, so they want their boys to go to school first. The girls, they don't have any, any value when it comes to education for them. So if they can get some money for her and not have the burden of having to care for her, it helps the family. The flags that you see on the homes over my shoulder represent a long-standing tradition that is very difficult on girls. As soon as a very young girl reaches puberty and she's of childbearing years, you'll see these flags above their houses representing the fact that a young girl is available to a man, essentially on the market, up for sale. And at that point, her life changes dramatically. So what they do is they take him out of school and they'll actually go through different activities, teaching them how to cook, how to be a, a wife in the, in the home. But part of it is also how to please a man. And that's through, you know, normal things in the house, but also sexually. So they teach them different things about sexuality and so on. So we are doing anything that we can to help people understand the value of girls. That's the key. And helping these girls by taking them into a program <laughs> called Imagine Hope. If they would live with us for six months and we would have devotions, lead them to the Lord, really mentor them in how to be a godly woman, and then at the same time teach them how to do some skills, basic things like jewelry making or whatever it is, that they can have some kind of an income that they can bring to their families. This is a good hat. Were you afraid when you thought that you were going to have to be married? Some of my friends, they are already married now, but they are used to suffer in that marriage. So if myself, I was afraid to be married while I'm still young, but because of this program, my mom, she didn't take me to the marriage, but she bring me here so that I can proceed with my education, so that I can help her in future change our situation. I, I'm so grateful. I wish I could bring everyone here and let them see the impact of what's happening. Um, and I'm grateful for it because we should give. And we should give to those that we don't benefit us. And I think that's what Hand of Hope does and, and we're grateful for that. We are helping young women like this all over the world. <laughs> Help us to guide, restore, and love young girls. Your designated gift today, if you choose, can go to Project Girl. Or you can give toward water, you can give toward feeding. And do something that you know will make a difference.